Tacky Talk time again. State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy is joining us for another uh, podcast episode. Hi, Tacky. Hey, good morning, Joe. Good to see you again on a bright and sunny Thursday. Yes, we've made it through uh, the first snowstorm <laughs> and, and, and Arctic blast. <laughs> well, my back hasn't uh, given out yet, so it wasn't too, too bad, I suppose. Uh, but I will admit, as you age, you can feel the chill in your bones a little more than you used to. This is so true. <laughs> the older you get, and, and I've been saying this now, is if I never see snow again for as long as I live, it'll be too soon. And I truly mean that. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, people will be saved. There's a, a few more uh, storm fronts coming this weekend into, into Martha Luther King Day on Monday. So, uh, you know, everyone just uh, be careful out there. Uh, I know uh, things are kind of uh, still challenging overall for all of us. But uh, now we have to uh, consider weather events and uh, hopefully people do not do the bread egg uh, run as we've seen in the past because uh, it's now pretty getting hard to get um, bread and eggs and milk and such uh, at the moment because of the large number of supply chain issues. I know. it's We really seem to be taking some steps backwards recently, unfortunately, with the whole pandemic situation, we're back to, you know, mask wearing and virtual things and supply issues. It's uh, it's a little disconcerting for a lot of folks, I'm sure. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, I'm in the same boat as everyone else regarding your emotional states and my emotional states associated with the pandemic and uh, all the other things around us regarding increased prices, uh, whether it be the food market or energy prices at home. As a most of you who are working from home, well, not most of us, but a lot of us are working from home. Uh, you know, you, you're actually paying high electric bills because you are working from home. Um, it's actually employers uh, with big office buildings are probably saving some money by having those offices empty, even though they're paying rent on an empty office space. So, uh, you know, I fully recognize that there is more incurred costs um, from working from home, particularly uh, when the season's very cold or very hot. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I was speaking to um, uh, Rania Kabuchi uh, at the Mass Hire Career Center here earlier this week about the unemployment rate, which is going down. You know, it's pretty low. It's almost pre-pandemic levels. But, you know, he, 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 he cautioned that a lot of that is people just leaving the workforce altogether. And he's probably right. Yeah, the so-called mass resignations is going out there. You know, I do uh, understand that people talk about expanded uh, safety net benefits, particularly unemployment, have been driving people keeping from getting back to the workforce. But those expanded benefits end in September. Right. Exactly. I mean, yeah. you, you can't you can't use that as the uh, reasoning anymore. It is, as you pointed out, people making career changes uh, and life changes uh, because of this pandemic. So some folks, again, if you know, some folks are looking at their pension and retirement funds, they've had a boomer year uh, last year, the stock market and your 401ks and other savings um, that they can, you know, it's a good time to cash out, downsize their home because real estate prices are high and uh, make plans for the next step in their lives. And other folks, particularly front facing uh, retail folks are thinking, you know, maybe I should uh, look at a change. And uh, we all know that a lot of uh, front facing work can be very backbreaking, would be stocking shelves or waiting tables. I mean, uh, I am not oblivious to that fact. It, can't, it is backbreaking work for folks and people don't, people don't get younger, right? I mean, the, the work does get harder. Um, but normally you see in a conventional recession, like in 08 and 03 and you know, back in the saving the loan issues or back in the, the early 90s, you know, people take an opportunity to change careers uh, during recessions because uh, of the huge economic impact and layoffs. And people often go back to school as well. And that nowadays, there's online opportun learning opportunities that create some more convenience for folks who may be still for working some level of front facing retail, but also a chance to get associates or a certificate or a different type of licensing to change careers. So, uh, because online learning has made a degree of convenience for that. Yep. So there's, there is, uh, not surprising, uh, you know, people are really changing jobs around as unemployment rate goes down. Uh, wages have gone up at the lower end of the, of the wage scale. Uh, to try to uh, compete, uh, to attract workers. Uh, but I was actually looking at medium household income for uh, the last year, and it's actually down from the year prior. Hmm. I, it, what unemployment rate was still high. Uh, people were unemployment. Unemployment does not replace your previous salary. Sure. Yeah. And the, the full impact of salary increases for lower end wages has not been fully seen. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, 2022 results in a 
a stagnant, lower or higher or medium household income, but we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. Yeah, the, the minimum wage in Massachusetts, I know, went up uh, the, the first of the year. I think it was fourteen twenty-five now. Um, I was surprised to see the federal minimum wage is still like seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. They're like way behind the times. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the federal government has uh, implemented for their contractors as part of the contracts a uh, higher minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour. But the, they have not changed the national law, uh, which is that would be the minimum standard. Uh, for decades at this point. And uh, many states have uh, stuck to the federal wage, but higher cost of living states have gone to a higher minimum wage. And in case, some cases, cities like Seattle, for example, if I remember correctly, uh, has a different minimum wage from the, from the state's minimum wage. Mm. Um, so uh, it is uh, not, uh, it is you know very commonplace to, to maintain the low minimum wage, but you know the inflationary prices uh, does nothing for a minimum wage, which is stagnant. It's not tied to any kind of economic increases. And of course, there's a ripple effect uh, on businesses and consumers and you at home uh, on the increased uh, prices of literally everything and the ripple effect it has uh, on all of us. Uh, so it's ironic because you got this kind of weird problem with your workers' wages can't go up. They can't buy stuff. Can't buy stuff. They can't live. They can't live. We got a problem, and then the businesses can't get people to buy their stuff because the wages too low. It's it's right. really kind of a vicious cycle. Yeah, exactly. Do you think uh, you'll see, or do you think the state should in the future invest more in workforce training for you know new new positions, new careers? I a uh, big advocate for that. I mean, I continue to be a very strong advocate for vocational education. I think at community colleges in particular, are most well positioned to uh, look into where there's deficits in the workforce and switch gears to doing that. UMass system can actually do that on their own in many ways. And obviously, you know, I would support more funding for those specific programs if they uh, do a strategic change. And Quincy College is another example of a place that can uh, strategically change uh, as needed with the changing workforce, uh, uh, especially now to have bachelor degrees is something you now offer. So, um, you know, it's uh, try to get, you know, affordable education the best you can. I know that it's still not cheap in Massachusetts by any stretch, but I mean, it does create better career opportunities in the long term. And, you know, I keep saying over again, healthcare and biotech mm-hmm. uh, are two places that continue to have a degree of workforce shortage. And even places like auto body shops, mechanics, windshield replacement, again, workforce shortages in locales. And you know, I've heard from the towing industries as well as, um, uh, heavy uh, machinery industries where d- people need commercial driver's license and special training license to drive uh, large vehicles. There's a shortage there. And they're uh, also doing uh, wage competition to attract talent mm-hmm. uh, to those businesses. So there are opportunities for folks who are uh, looking for new skill sets out there. And it could be as simple as getting a training for a commercial driver's license. Yeah, could lead to a whole new career, and obviously, depending on you know what you want to do, uh, some folks some folks would find that attractive to kind of be their own boss. Um, others want something a little bit more structured, um, you know, you know, with a with an office position. Um, so, you know, I guess that's the silver lining in all of this is there are opportunities. Yeah, and I always consider uh, finding a new opportunity for better wages. Uh, and sometimes maybe better hours or not, um, uh, depends on your life situation, uh, as an opportunity to uh, make one stepping stone to perhaps another stepping stone down the road in your uh, career. So, uh, you know, there's a shortage of a number of jobs during uh, this pandemic that you may be able to fill that role if you so desire, but also use that as an opportunity to make a couple extra dollars uh, given the race, the wage competition, uh, to look at, you know, where you want to go next from there. Mm-hmm. So that's the way I kind of look at it as well. Yeah. It's, do you think it's an opportunity, too, for uh, entrepreneurs who want to start you know, new businesses? Yeah, I think online businesses continue to be a trend, has been a trend for, for many, many years now. So it's not new. As people try to do new uh, types of service and businesses. I do think uh, one of the big challenges right now is that you want to start a brick and mortar business. As we've seen in Quincy, there's a series of new restaurants that are pending opening. This mm-hmm. it, I see like, you know, opening soon for a long time. I mean, those are the ones going to be very challenged right now, not be, just because of um, the nature of the pandemic and getting people to come to your business, but also the price of lim- uh, lumber, as we know, has been very high. We know that the cost of contracting work is very high to, to do any kind of home or business contracting. So uh, there are those additional costs in opening more brick and mortar style businesses out there. And 
uh, I would expect to see the word uh, opening soon to be uh, longer uh, as uh, these type of workforce uh, prices have been higher and shortage of certain types of construction supplies. Yeah, or if you can even find you know somebody to do the work because um, there's a shortage there too. So it's going to be uh, interesting 2022. It's going to take a while to flesh out, I think. Uh, agreed. We just have to get through uh, the next two or so weeks as we try to reach the peak of Omicron and then uh, go back down the other side of the peak and see what how the common code is going to try to kill us next, as sad as that may sound. Um, this is the common code uh, mutating uh, with its bigger, uglier, or younger cousin, as I like to put it, because it's a newer generation. Yeah. Uh, but I, I always tell folks there's a reason why this is tough is because we're fighting a relative to common cold virus. And that's been with us forever as people. Um, and uh, there's a reason why we've never really kind of beat it easily because uh, it, it just keeps changing us so quickly. I mean, everybody's yeah. kind of cold watching this at some point. It's yeah, really a chameleon of a, of a virus for sure. Yeah. And it got it in the science is trying to keep up with it all. I think there's an unrealistic expectation or two things. People think this is a stagnant issue, meaning what you know from a year ago is going to be the same as you know now. Well, that's a myth. Uh, and secondly, it is you know, a learn-as-you-go situation. It's frustrating, folks, because we like to have some definitive in our lives. All of us want to have some stability and knowledge of what's coming next. But we're dealing with a situation where every day we're learning something new. And again, as I talked about last time, the media has a hard time trying to keep up with this. And CDC's mixed messaging has not helped uh, the lack of, of you know, consistent communication of a message has not helped, uh, as well as uh, the patchwork uh, healthcare uh, approaches in each community, whether you're wearing masks, you know, vaccine acts, uh, vaccine verification, access to public spaces. Um, you know, the uh, right now we have the school closure issues is inconsistent here as well as the entire country regarding a COVID spread in schools. Uh, you know, I have a friend who told me that uh, in the class of 21 in Boston, 21 kids in her class uh, in elementary, you know, uh, you know, they're down to seven kids out of 21 that is still uh, still not uh, infected. Uh, you know, th there is a, a point here where um, it, it's hard for the news to explain the real impact on families because the families, you know, are so dispersed in their places. Uh, they all seen the impact individually. Yeah, that's tough. What do you think about the uh, the new the governor's announcement about the digital uh, vaccination uh, code, I guess, or QR code that you can get on your devices? Well, I'm going to tell you that some of you probably tried it and found that the information is not accurate. Uh, oh. I've heard that from people already. Okay. Uh, again, this is a the problem of this type of technology rollout is to trying to get it out. Uh, but they haven't like let it be fully vetted before release. You saw that the initial rollout of the scheduling for vaccines uh, last year, which uh, was a complete disaster. Um, you know, we've, we've seen that with its, uh, well, we can't really blame it for this one, but the unemployment system crashed because again, it was not designed for 14% unemployment in seven days. Right. Uh, so I can't really fault that one. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm with Atrius Healthcare, Harvard Vanguard, and I already have a QR code and a um, display on my phone, which cannot be screenshotted as I found out, uh, to show uh, you know, anyone who wants to see my vaccination status by phone. Of course, you can always make a photocopy and put it in your wallet or your other pocket or whatever. And uh, you know, obviously do not carry your actual vaccine card because it's been discovered, replacing it's kind of hard. Yeah. Uh, quite a few steps involved. So, uh, you know, it's great that, you know, they want to put in this kind of universal system so you can get your entire vac vaccination history in one spot. But you check with your healthcare provider. You, you might already be able to do this through uh, the local apps. A lot of hospitals, a lot of uh, larger doctor groups uh, does have uh, their own online portals and does have apps. And uh, you should take a look at that because I think people have been crying against a passport, a vaccine passports that can be raging emails from folks, you know, feeling like it's a violation of all kinds of, you name it, they say it kind of circumstance. Um, but uh, you, you actually could probably uh, contact your own healthcare provider and say, Hey, you guys have an app. How do you use it? I'm going to provide my uh, vaccination information easily. Uh, what, what, <laughs> Cause people know 
They say over and over again, it's sick a lot. But one of the funny things is now when you travel with this app, since it has your uh, medication and most recent medical records, you know, God forbid you get sick in another state or another locale, you can bring up your uh, entire medical history on your phone uh, and provide it to your, your doctor uh, on site uh, yeah. in case this occurs about mixed medication, uh, concerns about what your current treatment is. You can get to see your last blood work done before they start the next set of blood work so they have comparisons from mm. prior. I mean, technology on, on these little guys here, uh, if you want to use it properly, uh, you know, it can be a lifesaver. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's so it's so interesting because, as you say, all this information, all this data um, has already been available, you know, to private companies, private insurers, private healthcare providers, um, you, you name it. Um, but when when the government says they want it, then people get antsy. <laughs> There's just this distrust, I think, of, of government having information. Well, I mean, we distrust Facebook and Google and but people still won't get off Facebook and Google and Twitter, uh, which I find peculiar. It's like, you, know, you don't you don't trust these uh, systems, but you keep using it over and over again, feeding your information. And it's the guy that worked on some level of data privacy a couple of years back when we did an upgrade to our um, data privacy and consumer protection stuff uh, and holding more accountability to uh, people who hold our data. Uh, you know, people still, uh, talk about it and it's funny things that using social media talk about how much they hate social media it's like you're feeding the animal and uh one of the problems of doing that of course is that you get uh targeted advertising targeted feeds that only appeal to your sensibilities and uh, i think more so than ever as well uh, home now people have time to uh do work at home and surf the web uh, it's a monster feeding the monster what it wants and uh, some of you be like, you know, looking at this like, oh, no, that's not the case. I'm open-minded. You know, I look at the social media feeds. I mean, there's nothing that's not biased. I'm like, no, they don't make money on you uh, being unbiased. They only make money if you are biased. Right. It's the same behavior. Look at the sidebar about all your shopping habits because, you know, Facebook sold it, a good buy, uh, body or sold it from someplace to feed you uh, various ads. And even on watching online streaming, you know, on Hulu, uh, I was joking uh, to people online. I was like watching my shows and I'm getting these very interesting targeted ads regarding my sexual health, uh, my choice of underwear, my uh, shaving needs. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, advertising, like 90% was targeted towards a male audience uh, in my age bracket that may have a series of conditions and needs that are different from someone in their 20s or someone in their 60s. They know, they know a lot. They know who you are. They know what you like. They know when you watch, what you like to watch. Oh, yeah, they know. <laughs> yeah, and you, most people don't think about this stuff when they watch it because, you know, it's a commercial. But obviously, I pay far, far too much attention. And you know, those who know, I do have my acting card, my Screen Actors Guild card. I did go to acting classes. I did get uh, trained somewhat regarding media attention and watching magazines and commercials and know what to look for. Uh, because it's actually helpful in uh, media work if you actually watch advertising and read advertising to understand how the marketing system works and you can see a pattern develop. So mm -hmm. I do pay some attention. Now to say I'm unbiased would be wrong. I have biases like everybody else, but I'm very conscientious of what I'm watching. And, uh, you know, I recommend people do as well. Um, you know, just be aware uh, that everything you do online and now what you watch in streaming services with commercials and that was streaming services with commercials is targeting you. I mean, I'm watching a show uh, last night and they were showing commercials of the show I'm watching because they know I have a uh, desire to watch similar type content. Mm -hmm. but why would you watch a commercial about a show you're watching? I mean, you know, on the big three, ABC, CBS, NBC is what we, most of us grew up on. Yeah. You do not show a commercial about a show that you're watching that defeats the point of the commercial and waste a time slot and something else to be making money for you in that commercial time slot. Right, right. exactly, yeah. <laughs> time yeah. is precious. Time literally is money in that situation, yeah. Precisely. So in this case, it was Hulu. And I'm kind of like, now literally, they, they just spent 30 seconds on something they're actually watching. That could have been, if this was more of uh, the conventional uh, old uh, big three, they would, you know, that's lost revenue. That's right. That's all they have to sell is their time. So you know, every every second has to count. So clearly, the computer algorithm is faulty because they just lost the company some money. Right. 
right yep interesting it's so interesting the way this all works you know if you stop and think about it and actually like you say be aware of it you'll you'll notice how they're kind of you know manipulating you and and and, and, and uh, you know steering you no i i actually agree with that and, and nothing has done it more than this pandemic has made it very apparent exactly how much i mean you know we can talk about the trump years in politics and obama years in politics but you know, now we're in um, a situation where healthcare has been politicized in a whole different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, our safety has been politicized in a whole different way. Um, and uh, people uh, feel uh, the need to uh, pick and choose the facts. And suddenly everybody's a doctor. Everybody's <laughs> an epidemiologist. Everybody suddenly knows healthcare because it's my body and I know best. Well, that's great. But this ain't about you. This is about us. And I've said this over and over again. And uh you know, if, if your mentality is all about you and uh, you come first, that's fine. But if you want to take responsibility for you and what happens to the rest of us, they will not answer that question. Right. Uh, new year and a new law supposed to go into effect, Techie, as you're well aware, the right to repair law. Yep. Right to repair was uh, approved by the voters uh, in the last election cycle um, in 20, uh, 2020 election cycle. And uh, the law has been suspended uh, by the attorney general uh, pending a federal court case going on, which the judge has delayed issuing a pay and actually reopened evidence uh, again uh, for the first, actually not again, reopened evidence for the first time in this case, and uh, still is pending a decision. So my committee uh, oversees the, the car right repair issue, has done so for the last dozen years. I've only chaired this since 2017. And the committee's in a bit of a holding pattern because you shouldn't really make new laws so you know what the court is going to do because if you do a new law, they have to go back and change the law again to do what the court says. Right. This happened before and uh, it makes you look stupid just letting you all know. Uh, and uh, I prefer not to look more foolish than I have to most days. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> so we've had some uh, bills before us to try to change the law around a little bit regarding uh, access to telemetrics, uh, accessing um, uh, certain types of vehicles, uh, trying to exempt certain types of vehicles and the such. So, uh, you know, again, the laws uh, suspended uh, by the Attorney General on enforcement because it's not enforced, it's essentially suspended. Uh, so for those who need a refresh, the right to repair uh, law was approved by the voters overwhelmingly to allow third-party car dealers, uh, car, I'm sorry, repair shops, you know, the non-dealer repair shops, to access the telemetry data. And you're asking what's your telemetry data? Your telemetry data is everything in your car, from what radio stations to channel, if your seatbelt's being used, the speed of your car and your GPS and anything your phone's connected to, including your contact information. Now, it's a very broad term, telemetrics. Now, the law talks about the fact that you're supposed to only access your uh, repair data, but they can already access repair data currently without accessing telemetric data. Hmm. They already have the equipment and machinery. There's also nothing in the law that prevents them from reselling your data if they've acquired information from your car, nor does any privacy protections for you uh, on a third party repair shop. So, if, uh, any uh, third party repair shop or any repair shop tells you they want access to your telemetric data, yeah, you should really just flat out say no. Because there's no uh, there's no criminal no civil penalties for any of these repair shops to uh, get the information do what they want with it. Oh, do you have the option to do that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you, you it actually uh, actually it's actually kind of funny. The uh, repair shop has right to access, and the repair shop can actually give someone else the right to access too. Oh, so they have more rights mm-hmm. than the car owner does. Yeah, there's a little funky spot in that bill that people didn't spot that basically allows uh, assignment of right. Interesting. Okay. So you really have to trust your repair shop. Yeah. And trust me, people want to make money and uh, you know, people want to be able to you know, sell stuff to you. Some of you may, may not notice uh, whether it be on your phone or your uh, car based GPS that, you know, it downloads data on a regular basis from the deal uh, from the manufacturer actually it provides information on things like gas stations. Yeah. So what's to prevent, um, there's nothing that prevents uh, in the law from uh, any repair shop from downloading data onto your telemetrics about things like go to this food joint, for example, and they've been selling uh, their ability to do so. And you're like, well, that's kind of high-end technology. I'm like, well, guess what? People can figure that out if we yeah. haven't learned so far that 
trust me, someone will figure it out. Interesting. And these repair shops, I'm sure, are being solicited for that information uh, because then they could make some money off it. Yeah, if the law goes into effect, it'll be within five years, that particularly the bigger repair shops like the Sullivan Tires, which is not a mom and dad store by any stretch, uh, you know, would be in a better position than you know, your corner uh, small business uh, to be able to you know, sell that information and, and break ground profit off of you. So, yeah, yeah. You know, and then people will get, you know, they're unscrupulous people or people think it's harmless to do certain things, but you know, it's not. And uh, you would never know. That's the, that's the beauty of the right to repair bill. Consumer will never know exactly what happened. There's yeah. no discovery requirement. They don't have to tell you. So, so who's is it? Is it the manufacturers that are they're suing? They want they want to stop this. Yes, the manufacturers of cars are, are looking to stop this uh, law going into effect. Uh, one of the major reasons is because it only is in Massachusetts, even though uh, we are a high income state and you know we're a pretty powerful market at seven million people. Uh, they would have to redesign their cars specifically uh, for the uh, for the oh. state of Massachusetts. They have to redo the entire software system for one state. Oh, okay. So it cost them money, so they don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also confusing because now you got to do customizations on on the software system, and uh, one of it's a web portal where a lot uh, requires everyone to go to a single portal so people can get your telemetric data on the internet. Think about that one. You want your telemetric data sitting on a website somewhere? No, no. Yeah. Hmm. Especially not GPS and contact information data. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic violence organizations have a serious concern about domestic uh, GPS data being available. Uh, we, we are aware uh, through my committee work on uh, domestic violence, believe it, I should do some domestic violence awareness through my committee. Mm. Uh, that, uh, you know, people will stalk. Uh, abusers will stalk. Abusers will follow uh, their victims. And, uh, you know, this provides a new avenue uh, for someone to do it, particularly you got a buddy at a repair shop and doesn't know your situation at home. We have no idea what's going on at home. And people uh, ask what seemed to be innocent information, but it turns out to be malicious. Mm. Hmm. Okay. So that's why it's not in effect yet. Yeah, the lawsuit by the manufacturers, you know, also argues it's an interstate issue. It's a federal issue because of Commerce Clause. Cars go on the state lines. People can buy these cars in Rhode Island. Bring them to Massachusetts. Those cars in Rhode Island will not be complying with state law. They have to redo the entire cars. So they can bring them from Rhode Island to Massachusetts. Oh yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's it's pretty involved. Um, so I mean, there's there's a, a a series of you know federal arguments out there. We're just kind of I'm just kind of waiting out as committee chair, waiting for some legal guidance. That's all. Okay. All righty. What what uh, what is going on on Beacon Hill these days, Tanky? No, it's quiet right now, to be perfectly honest. So we went through a very swift opening uh, ceremonial session at the beginning of the month. Uh, Dread Route 10 is February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. Seems like every day is Groundhog's Day. And uh, the committee chairs are moving very rapidly, getting hearings done, and uh, executive sessions going and polling going with the membership to move bills forward. Speaker's office is uh, very uh, interested in committee chairs' progress. Uh, committee chair meetings are happening this week, I think, into next month. Uh, so uh, speaker can set his priorities going into um, spring and fall. I mean, fall, spring and summer. I'm hoping for fall already, as you can tell. Yes. Uh, and uh, obviously, we always talk about the budget because the budget process is so long. Uh, you know, governor's budget's coming out. Governor's state and state's coming out this month. Um, mm. And uh, Ways and Means meetings are going to start with membership starting uh in uh, February, most likely on Valentine's Day, moving to St. Patrick's is when we have a lot of ways and means meetings. Okay. I'm starting to prep my request. I'm still got the opera money, but the federal opera money infrastructure that's uh, still pending. We're probably going to debate that also uh, coming up in March uh, through June, somewhere in that time frame. Um, and, uh, you know, as State House News reported this week, uh, well, the windmill bill has been a priority for uh, the speaker. He wants to expand uh, wind power big time in Massachusetts as part of a renewable energy portfolio. And uh, we hope to get some more information soon on the details on uh, what Telecom and TV's and NG chair is proposing on uh, how to uh, improve windmill construction, um, not necessarily in Massachusetts, but, you know, in, in basically Block Island, off Rhode Island, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, uh, you know, for us to buy more uh, renewable power. I thought the ARPA bill was, was all done, Techie. We did everything but roads and bridges. Oh, okay. 
So we spent just about half-ish, give or take. So the other half-ish is all roads and bridge money. So uh, you can uh, bet that I'm going to be chasing some of that for some city-related road projects in the district, as well as the entire delegation will. Uh, so the question really becomes, I know it's a couple of billion dollars, everyone says it's a lot of money, but you know, it vanishes pretty quickly. You know, yes. If you start five and 10 and $20 million at a time, depending on the size of the project. So it'll be a negotiation. And uh, you know, my attitude is get, get something off the loaf as opposed to nothing off the loaf. So we'll be in there fighting the, to try to get as much as we can. Okay, yeah, it's, um, it seems to be one of the major com- complaints about city services is the condition of the roads. Well, I also remind folks, the city of Quincy has like $46 million or something like that of ARPA money, which they have almost free reign to use, as well as the county government has quite a bit of ARPA money too, which I still think they haven't decided how to do disbursements. Hmm. Um, and you throw in uh, the fact that, you know, the school systems could use better ventilation systems. We all discovered now they receive uh, federal assistance in the prior year directly also uh, to uh, get money for the school systems to be COVID ready. Uh, that money was distributed uh, through the previous uh, stimulus bill. Um, I think there's more like four of them from the feds now. It's I think like so. Just, I think that's right. Yeah. They all like meld in your brain after a while. It's true. But, but the city has, you know, received a lot of money <laughs> from the federal government to address COVID needs. And, you know, as taxpayers you know, watching this, you know, you should have your right to ask your city councilors and your mayor. Uh, you know, uh, Mayor Koch and your individual counselors exactly what that money has been spent on. Mm. Um, you know, it's not a fair question to ask. Oh, so absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I know some of it uh, was spent on buying the Monroe Building. Uh, another portion was spent buying some land down off the Southern Artery around the Southern Tide Mill area. Um, I don't know what else, but there's, I'm sure there's others too. Sure. And, uh, you know, but again, I mean, you know, the schools could use better ventilation and particularly the older schools. And you have, uh, you know, other road and project, road and bridge projects that are pending out there. And uh, even though, you know, there's talk about upgrading City Hall, I mean, you could create more COVID ready circumstances. And, um, you know, I've also had public employee ask me about early retirement and ask me about, mm. you know, COVID pandemic pay. And the city government can also use a portion of their money for COVID pandemic pay. So I also can use it for grants uh, to help uh, float along restaurants and other small local retail businesses. They can use uh, the information for COVID outreach. They can use it to buy test kits mm-hmm. for the schools, uh, for public employees, uh, PPE. I mean, they're a very broad use of that money. I love the fact they keep looking at us like, you know, give us more. But, you know, <laughs> we're fully aware how much our cities and towns got. Trust me, every right. legislator I talk to know exactly how much money the community got. And uh, I can't tell you how to spend it because I'm just another a resident of the city, uh, mm-hmm. like everyone else in this call. Uh, but you know, hey, it's it's uh, you know, it's responsibility of uh, every resident to ask uh, their city government, as same as to ask the state government. Uh, you know, where where's where's the uh, where's the beef, right? <laughs> Very good, Ducky. Yes, <laughs> folks of our generation know that saying for sure. Yeah, yeah. way back machine now, right? <laughs> so, uh, but you know, that, that is, that's not lost in the state government. Trust me, every legislator looks at their municipal governments. We know how much you all got. And uh, again, I, I'm just another resident like you all. Um, but uh, you know, you guys can decide uh, on this call how you guys want to. You know, ask uh, your municipal officials on how they're spending forty-six dollars plus, plus tens of million dollars of you know federal assistance money targeted towards things like schools and other stuff. And where's the money going? Yep, yep. Actually, uh, this we're recording this uh, February thirteenth. I think is that right? Yeah, thirteenth and no, January. We're, Jan- we're still in January. We're not in February yet. Oh, January. Yes, I know. We're all trying to like just rush through this. <laughs> This time I get through it. Well, um, I'm with you. I, I, we just want to get through this more. Just get yeah. through this quickly. But the governor is here in Quincy today to open the new general's bridge. Well, it's good to see the bridge open. Uh, I've uh, well, I'm not going much places. I think I pretty much said that multiple times at the moment. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the traffic dynamic works on that bridge. Uh, I was under the false impression apparently it's going to be a one way off. Uh, off uh, Bergen onto uh, what used to be the parking way. Uh, Dunford Road now is what it's called. Yeah, so, Dunford Drive, yeah. Drive, so uh, I I don't know how this is going to work till we actually try it. So 
um, I eventually have to go get food and stuff to live. So maybe I'll give it a try and see how it works. I, I have no idea how this traffic pattern is going to go. Yeah, it's all brand new. So nobody really does. It goes over the MBTA tracks. Uh, I think the idea is to you know bring people right to the center of downtown uh, to the new parking garage there and then free, you know um, patronize the businesses, certainly in the area. Yeah, and I saw in, in uh, the Patriot Ledger that uh, Fox Rocks is no longer going to build a 22-story building. They withdrew the proposal, and they're going to do more of a two-ish, what, three-ish, some much smaller uh, height complex uh, with a parking garage and some re- uh, retail and commercial businesses there. So um, maybe the travel pattern be more apparent, as you pointed out, with a new development there. But I don't know if this, this bridge was meant to do 22-story building or a two- or three-story building. I don't know, actually. I mean, mm. You know, as you can tell, I'm kind of uh, unclear uh, until we see the, it in action, see how it works. Uh, a lot of that project was, again, also state money. Yes. You know, that uh, the city applied and got as part of the over downtown infrastructure plan. That's so right. yep. you got a few options now. You can coming uh, north down in Bergen, you can, you can cross over at the Paul Howard Bridge. You got this General's Bridge. And we can go to the very end of Grand Street, bang a right, uh, like we've done pretty much most of our lives. <laughs> because we didn't have the other bridges. Uh, and then, you know, go down um, Hancock Street that direction. I don't know. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to have to try it myself. Yep. Okay. Something something new to play with here, here in the city. <laughs> oh, yeah, new adventure is a good adventure, it feels like, these days. Yeah. Well, at least it's something you can you can do social distancing in your car by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are my entertainment through uh, most of uh, the height of the pandemic was going through the car wash. That was kind of like <laughs> entertainment. I mean, you just crack the window, throw the money out, close the window, and just kind of enjoy your one minute ride through the car wash. <laughs> yeah, the, the cleanest car in the neighborhood. You go to the car wash every day just to get out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Things to entertain yourself with. So, well, we should, um, you know, maybe talk a little bit about um, local things that are maybe happening or maybe not happening. Um, it's Lunar New Year is coming up soon. Um, other community groups uh, usually have things around Valentine's Day. I don't know what's going to be happening this year. A lot of stuff been postponed uh, or not happening still. There's a lot of uncertainty going on about being in big crowds. Uh, the city, uh, again, the few times they get to things like the market and you know, obviously, I get gas every so often. I don't drive as much as I used to. Uh, but, you know, obviously, I still have to uh, get errands done. And, you know, people, are, you know, I have to say, you know, 85%, 80 you know, close to 90%, you know, are mask wearing folks. I mean, I, you know, commend the city on just uh, just taking responsibility for yourself and protect others uh, to uh, wear a mask and, uh, you know, continue to sanitize. But, you know, large crowded areas, uh, proximity and time is increasing your odds of disease. Um, even with a mask on, you know, air does escape on the edges, but you know, everyone's wearing a mask, your reduction of, uh, you reduce greatly your chance of infection, even in, in close contact, but the longer you're together, the higher the odds of getting sick. So Lunar Year Festival is going virtual um, for the second year. It's it's an only event that draws about 5,000 people plus, as I've attended many of these in the past. And yeah. Asian resource, Quincy Asian Resource is now switching gears. Uh, I do understand that North Quincy High School also has um, trying to do some uh, Lunar New Year uh, celebration education for their students as more diversity inclusion. Uh, I'm not sure how that's gonna go. Um, You know, we all are aware of the infection rate in the school systems. Um, A lot of the Chinese New Year events in Chinatown, a lot of banquets and dinners celebrating it with the various businesses and different family organizations have not occurred. Uh, they're, They're all essentially been canceled at this stage or maybe postponed deep into the spring or I'm not sure what's going to happen. Right. Um, That's a big financial hit, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah and the Vimini's community has the TET. Yep. Uh, and uh, I'm aware that I believe there's one at the World Trade Center in South Boston, again, a giant complex, but unclear about whether they're going to be able to pull it off. And you also had the, my alumni, Boston College High School, and uh, I'm not sure if they're, uh, I don't think they're going to be able to pull it off this year as well. Um, and of course, it's too cold and the weather's too uncertain to try to uh, shift these events to outdoor venues. And uh, even neighborhood associations have all been tenuous on events, even outdoor events. Um, you know, they've, they've uh, uh, you know, sudden notice changes is 
becoming quite commonplace. Yes. I know none of us like to get these sudden changes in notice and plans, but you know, there is a importance of uh, trying to keep each other safe and trying to, but still trying to hold a, you know, a neighborhood together. And MOK events another year, um, you know, and again, my alumni at BC High, you know, does have OK events. They're not doing any really this year. They're doing uh, some, uh, you know, letting people know by email and statements from school. Cities had on and off different types of MOK events over the years. You know, obviously, that's not going to happen this year. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a stay tuned situation any moment things can change. And I remind again, folks, that if you have a local organization that you need to support and you wish to um, show their support, even though they can't hold a conventional fundraisers, you know, you can spare a couple of dollars, obviously, you know, you know please do. You mm-hmm. have to all decide, you know, what poor organizations are to you. Right. Quarry is one of those. Certainly they are, you know, very active in providing meals to folks, um, uh, English language learning programs, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, immigrant assistance programs. So that's certainly a worthy local group. Yeah, and they're also looking to see if they can provide assistance to Afghan refugees as that influx starts coming to Massachusetts uh, over the course of next, uh, this year now, it's 2022. So uh, Afghanistan is in Asia. Uh, I think people tend to forget mm. where it is in geography. And uh, it's part it's, of the Asian continent, yes, right, yeah, it is actually part of the Asian continent, so you know, they need to, you know, look at uh, whether they can provide services to that population, and we'll uh, wait and see uh, what they come up with. But like all of us, you know, learn as we go, and you know, none of expected to have a, a large Afghan refugee population come in, but they are coming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We talk a little bit about um. Uh, national politics, Jackie, and uh, I think last time we talked, it was the Russia-Ukraine situation. Not much has changed since then, really. No, there's ongoing conversations. I mean, the Russians uh, staked out not a surprising argument that they don't want former Soviet bloc countries to join NATO. Uh, for those who follow European uh, politics, uh, no big surprise over time, a lot of former Soviet bloc countries end up joining NATO. Uh, and many want to get into the EU's uh, trading bloc. It is uh, very smart economics for them to have free trade uh, with part of the EU. The EU is a very wealthy area of the world. Uh, and if you're a, um, uh, you know, you're a uh, less strong economic region, uh, the benefits of a large, being part of a larger block in terms mm-hmm. of things like healthcare and pension, education, travel access, free trade is a big boon for uh, nation development uh, and wanting to grow strong economically. And NATO obviously provides that massive security umbrella against uh, Russia. So obviously uh, uh, Europe and the U.S. are like, no, we're not going to agree to that because uh, we don't want to you know, restrain any country's application right. to NATO. Whether NATO accepts your application is a whole different conversation, right? right. Yes, exactly. But you don't want to restrict someone's ability to apply. Uh, a country's ability to apply. And, you know, Ukraine has gone uh, not pro-Russia anymore. People may remember that uh, when the Crimea event happened and Russia took it over, uh, it was a pro-Russian president in uh, Ukraine. It has now changed. It's amazing how invading a country has <laughs> had the population turn on a president. Imagine that when you have tanks rolling down Main Street. You kind of, you know, put off by that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing how the population don't think it's cool that you thought it was okay to allow that to happen. Just say it. You know, and of course, there's still skirmishes on the border of Ukraine and uh, Russia. It's, uh, Russia wants to claim more territory, and you know they're trying to take advantage of some local ethnic um, divisions between um, the Ukraine government and, and some of the local folks. And that's um, that's going on as well. So it's it's uh, it's going to be a tense situation, and we'll wait and see how it goes. And you know, I do think that the uh, Biden administration and the European allies, you know, are taking the correct position. You've got to take a strong stance here and, and hold a line. Sanctions have already been done in Russia before they used to at this stage, sadly. So, uh, and they're not really part of really many free trading blocks. Right now, they're trying to see if you can get some kind of decent trading block with China, uh, but they don't have great trading block access. So um, it's not like there's a status quo. It's really going to come down to a showdown on 
whether or not uh, they're going to test uh, American and European resolve, exactly. uh, uh, maintain and keep a sovereign nation, uh, and uh, whether or not you know we want to um, uh, provide security in that region from aggression. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a U.S. and European action inside their basic sphere. I mean, it's inside their zone. Yep. To, to to maintain a security and status quo. We'll yeah. See. Hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. But you know, you can be China. They locked down 20 million people again. So it just astounds me every time that happens. Um, it's just unfathomable, you know, to 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 understand just the logistics of how that works. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. Uh and uh, you know, it's gotta have a negative impact in your economy. Again, they're not become a commercial service economy, just like the U.S. They're moving away from manufacturing. They're, no, they're becoming less and less a cheap manufacturing country. So, I mean, they're locking down these massive cities. They provide groceries to drop on people's stores. Uh, the, uh, I know it's all government-owned social media. It's government-owned uh, state media. It's not a free press and all that. But, you know, it's interesting that people are now complaining about the treatment, um, you know, on how they're getting their food and they're locked in for three weeks and mandatory testing. I mean, the complaints are show, showing up on so, uh, state-owned social media, and the government's trying to respond. Uh, but the Beijing Olympics are four weeks and less away. Yep. yep. No, uh, no outside spectators. A quarantine period or what rival plus testing, and China is pretty much made the last place on the planet that's going to is a, on a zero policy on COVID infections. They see one infection, they close everything uh, to stop the spread, and Omicron's already in there. Uh, and uh, for a zero. A tolerance country. In fact, our crime got in is, is not a good sign. Uh, and it'd be interesting if, you know, being four people, a uh, country is going to shift to, unfortunately, what everyone's going to at this point, we're going to have to figure out how to live with this in the long term and continue mm -hmm. advancement of vaccinations and medical treatment, which is something that China really hasn't done. They haven't gone forward in advancement of medical treatment as well as new vaccine development. And this is where it gets kind of scary where, um, you know, let's say they do continue zero tolerance. Maybe we get past Omicron, uh, but you know, I'm not saying Omicron's gonna be gone all the time. I mean, it's not gonna disappear overnight, but it's you know, we've got to pass through this. Mm -hmm. But you know, given the fact that their vaccinations hasn't caught up with the new variants, and that uh, you know, if Omicron sneaks in and it, you know, we know it spreads in a three day doubling rate, so you got a you know, 13 million person city, it moves like wildfire. You know, it is milder symptoms, but we have a higher hospitalization rate. And, you know, you look at that against 1.4 billion people, or even a city like Beijing, that's 22 men. You know, you have you know, still got about 10 to 15%, you know, high uh, serious, serious illness, 10 to 15% zone. That means the hospital is going to get overrun in a heartbeat. Yeah. And even the death rate is only 1% or half a percent, unless they go from, drop it from two to, to let's say, good bed real generous here, go from a 2% death rate to half percent, you know, against 22 million people. It's a lot of people still, yeah. It's a lot of people. And we saw that in New York during the initial COVID uh, uh, virus of a city of just under 9 million people. And remember, there were mass graves. People seem to forgot that already. Those big uh, construction machines uh, dropping mass graves as if we're in uh, South America. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't unsee once you see that in the news. And it's like, you know, we saw the same thing in South American countries. You can't unsee that as soon as you see it on the news. But, uh, you know, people, um, you know, memories are a little bit short, I guess. Yeah. Um, or, or, you know, trying to block out trauma, I think, is part of our survival. Yeah. Unfortunately, with some of this trauma is the reason we have survival. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it reminds you we shouldn't be doing this. So China is actually a very interesting situation where, um, they're trying to shoot themselves from the rest of the world, uh, taking uh, what we consider extreme measures to stop the spread. Uh, we, we, uh, but they do have a very different hospital system. Uh, and they do have a very different approach on, on how to manage it. But at some point, they got to open up people to visit again and let people out of the country to visit somewhere else. And as they uh, approach the next national conference this fall and winter, uh, you know, uh, Xi Jinping uh, is looking for his uh, lifetime presidency, for lack of a better term, because he goes third term, five year term, and uh, COVID is a huge platform for him, a platform for him to uh, you know justify another five year term uh, with his Congress and the people. So they're not elected by, by uh, Chinese president is not elected by the public; it's elected by the Congress. Right. 
in the part pop, as we've seen, he's extremely powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's a crucial for him to have a, a successful Beijing Olympics to provide a positive face to Ro, a, a Chinese success story on a global stage. Uh, it'd be interesting if athletes will make political statements from the podium. If they are going to have a podium at all, I have no idea what's going to right. happen. Right. Uh, and uh, there'll be no uh, spectators uh, allowed. Uh, so, it can yeah. be. And the media is going to be under strict control. So, yeah. Yeah, national, international media, international media is going to be very strict control. You, you should be seeing stories about press zones at some point uh, where they're no longer allowed to uh, roam the streets or interview anybody they want. And uh, it's going to be very contained. And uh, I expect uh, you're going to see every media outlet, doesn't matter where you're on the political spectrum, uh, you know, going to talk about, um, you know, media restriction access in, in the Beijing Olympics. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see how it goes. It's going to be very different from the old Summer Olympics. This is a totally different uh, political situation, geopolitical situation. Of, and of course, COVID has, uh, you know, pushed on top of that too. All right. Until next time, Tacky, uh, reach out to you. Yeah, 617-722-2014, 617-722-2014. At this point, hopefully, I memorized phone number, repeating it enough times. Taki dot chan at mahouse dot gov, t a c k e y dot c h n at mahouse dot gov. I'm still receiving a lot of testimony, but it's not as bad as it was two weeks ago when my email box was blowing up. And uh, you know, obviously, I got my Facebook page, State Representative Taki Chan. It is a public page. There is no um, uh, sign up requirement. You could be anybody and just go on like a regular website. Uh, and uh, you will uh, actually, I think the last posting we had was regarding um, civil exerp, civil service exams for police officers is up. So mm-hmm. any interest in something like that, you know, visit the uh, Facebook page uh, and, uh, you know, click the links there to get to the application. And uh, obviously I obviously have a Twitter account at Tacky Chan and uh, TackyChan.org is more of a resource page for people to find some phone numbers uh, as well as calling my office directly. So it, there's plenty of uh, ways to do this, including, you know, watching me and Joe here on QA TV uh, once a week, maybe once every two weeks, depending on the schedule we have. And, you know, we just talk about whatever sometimes. Yeah, we talk about Tacky's hair and his broken car and his, you know, menu choices. <laughs> maybe some, maybe some, uh, some substantive issues are in there too. <laughs> Oh, I guess uh, through this uh, almost, uh, well, we're not, almost two year process. I think we started this April in 2020. I think people know a little more about uh, what I do on the daily life than they ever had before. And they certainly know about all your tassels behind behind you from all your degrees. <laughs> yeah, my uh, pine cone tree and uh, my brother and I uh, tassels from, from, uh, from high school to uh, graduate school. So... Uh, you know, a small family tradition behind us, and that's be kind of the the mainstay plus part of the um, the dish cabinet. That's right. <laughs> little little wooden piece on this side, and sometimes you catch a light switch on the other side. If, if the yeah, I think we, I think we had a cameo appearance from your mom in one of these. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I mean, you can interview her if you want. I mean, I think people enjoy that more than seeing me. Oh, then we get the real story of Tacky. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Good to talk to you as always. Appreciate it, Tacky. Good to talk to you, Joe, and I'll see you in a week's time. 